Hi, Max Feinstein, physician and mediocre YouTuber here, reporting on the so-called July effect, which, if true, could mean an alarming trend for patients in the hospital. In today's video, we'll be discussing specifically whether the July effect is anything that's relevant to the field of anesthesiology and the new residents who are just beginning. Let's check in with our reporter at the desk and learn more about the July effect and what it means for all of us. Medical students across the country are trading in their sketchy micro subscription and in exchange getting a nice long flowy white coat as they head into the wards with the newly minted title of doctor. It's an exciting time for everyone, but it's nerve wracking to be sure. I recall the very first time that I put in an order as a physician for a medication. It was for 10 milliequivalents of potassium, and let me tell you that I quadruple checked this order before I put it in. Of course, 10 milliequivalents of potassium is about as much potassium as a banana contains. Nevertheless, I was extremely nervous to make sure that it was the exact right order for the right patient. Doctors should always be careful when writing any prescription, whether it's their first or 10,000th time prescribing a medication for a patient. Given just how many newly minted doctors there are treating patients starting in July, there is an age-old concern that hospitals somehow might be less safe in July, and this has been termed the July effect. You might be concerned about the July effect if you found this systematic review which looked at 39 different studies and concluded that there's increased mortality and decreased efficiency in hospitals in July. But then you'll probably be less concerned if you actually open up the study and look in the conclusion section and see that the authors indicate that their findings weren't exactly what they would describe as firm. You'd probably be even less concerned if you took a look at the date for this study, which was published over a decade ago, and itself includes studies that are even older than that. So it's hard to say that this has a lot of relevance to hospital safety today. You might start feeling more reassured if you looked at a more recent study that was published in JAMA that looked at 1.5 million surgical patients and the outcomes that they had in July compared to other time periods. The authors concluded, without qualification, that surgical mortality was equal in the summer months or perhaps even less as compared to the non-summer months. In fact, the authors point out that the winter months are associated with a slightly higher surgical mortality rate as compared to the summer months. The authors hypothesize that this may have to do with the fact that people in the hospital are extra vigilant in July when it's known that there are new trainees who have entered the system. I personally explain this with the Feinstein hypothesis of freezing, which states that people just do better when it's warmer outside and the cold weather sucks. Anyways, the perspective that I can offer as I am just about to begin my fourth year of anesthesiology residency is that it is true what the authors say, which is that across the hospital system, everyone knows that newly minted doctors are entering the hospital in July, and so I think there's a sense of hypervigilance to make sure that they are off to a good start taking safe care of patients. It's not like that 10 mil equivalent bag of potassium that I ordered for a patient years ago was just thrown at the patient without anybody else checking to make sure it was okay. After I order this medication in the electronic health record, there are multiple other physicians who see it, which include the senior resident, possibly a fellow, and the attending physician. Then the order gets double checked by pharmacy. And in fact, pharmacists are known for picking up on medication errors, whether it comes from a new resident or someone who's been doing this for decades. Oh, uh, what are all those marks? Hmm? Oh, the tally marks, yeah. Um, that's how many patient lives we've saved. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, not bad for a week. Tony, you got another one. Yeah, boss, somebody ordered 100 milligrams of Dilaudid. And of course, the person who's actually administering the medication is the nurse. So when the nurse gets an order for a medication, they'll get it out of the machine or storage cabinet, draw it up and make sure that it seems like an appropriate medication and dose for the patient. Nurses play an extraordinarily important role in picking up on medication errors that otherwise may go unnoticed. But what I just described really applies to floor medicine and it's actually quite a bit different in the operating room when we're talking about anesthesiology. Before we continue, we're gonna take a quick break and hear from the sponsor of today's video. Today's video is sponsored by 
me. Even though I am a full-time resident, I do make time outside of work to make these videos, and I hope you find them helpful. If you do, I'd really appreciate it if you liked this video and subscribed to the channel. That might even help my chances of matching successfully to Pediatric Anesthesia Fellowship. Well, that's probably not true, but it certainly couldn't hurt, so why don't you go ahead and throw the video a like? See what happens. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Generally speaking, one of the ways in which anesthesiology is different from many other specialties is that physicians are the ones who are not only picking out the medications to administer, but then drawing it up themselves and administering it directly to patients. In anesthesiology, because there aren't other people who are involved with picking out what medication to administer and then actually administering it, then the process for trainees to become comfortable and administer medication safely is a little bit different than other areas of medicine. In my program, the anesthesiology residents who are just beginning are paired up one-to-one -one with attending physicians who are with them in the operating room at all times. In this way, anesthesiology is a lot like an apprenticeship because you learn so much from your preceptor who teaches you how to navigate in the operating room. And if you're really lucky, you'll have a preceptor that not only teaches you anesthesiology, but also is willing to sit down and be interviewed for one of your very first YouTube videos. Then anesthesiology residents are slowly granted autonomy to have a little bit of time in the operating room without the attending physician directly in there at exactly the same time. This is a very graduated process that can start with the attending maybe just standing in the corner, and then a week later maybe the attending is outside the operating room, but definitely not too far. This process of giving autonomy to residents is only done once the residents have demonstrated that they have the knowledge and the aptitude for doing clinical anesthesiology. Perhaps one of the most important skills that they need to be able to demonstrate is understanding when they need to call for help. This is an important skill for any anesthesiologist, not just someone who's an early trainee, because when things go wrong in the operating room, regardless of how much experience you have, it's always good to bring in other sets of eyes and other sets of hands to help out. So even though you might be the only anesthesiologist in the room, you're never far from having other people in the room. In my hospital, if I pick up the phone that's next to every single one of our anesthesia machines and I dial a quick phone number and ask for help, they will literally send as many anesthesiologists as will fit in an entire operating room. I've only been in a position to do that a couple times over the course of the last three years, but it's very comforting to know that there's always help available when I need it. Even as anesthesiology residents gain a lot of autonomy as they progress through their training, they're never really alone because the attendings can easily watch what's going on on the electronic medical record, including the patient's vital signs. And at least in my hospital, there are literally video cameras in every operating room and there's an anesthesiologist who's monitoring these video cameras continuously. So if there is a problem, they can zoom in and see exactly what's going on or perhaps more importantly, be able to identify when a problem may arise and be able to address it before it actually becomes a problem. If you're an anesthesia resident watching this video, you know what I'm talking about. I know you can relate. If you enjoyed this video, check out this video I made where I talk about everything that goes into becoming an anesthesiologist. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Max Feinstein, physician and mediocre YouTuber.